Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Especially welcome to the 500 or so new subscribers off the back of the last video. What a great response, thanks so much for watching. And especially also to my fantastic supporters on Patreon. Today we're going to be looking at a Sinclair product which isn't a computer, it is a multimeter. Check this out. I got this in a bundle, an eBay bundle, and it was a fantastic little extra. It wasn't even the reason I bought the bundle, and I've been dying to get it plugged in and cleaned up and calibrated if I can get it working. So let's see how we get on with it. So here it is on the bench and I love it already. I love how tactile it is, I love the colours. I think it's going to look great alongside the speckies that we'll be using it on. It's a shame that the LED filter bit of plastic screen thing here has fallen in, but we'll take it apart and we'll stick that on again. Turning it round and look at the power input. It's two banana plug sockets, which is a bit strange. Uh, they did sell a Sinclair mains adapter for this, which definitely didn't have banana plugs on the end. So I don't know, maybe this is an early one or one specific for labs. We have the Sinclair address here in St. Ives on the back. And looking at the front, we can see it's not in mint condition, but that's okay. It's not a collector's piece and I am planning to use it. These buttons are all fantastic. I love the colors. Uh, the, the functions are all blue. The ranges are beige or gray. And we have a, a switch here for switching between battery power with an internal battery or an external power supply here just by pressing that red button there. On the front as well we have the sockets for our probes and the output here which is for seven segment LED displays. Here's an advert I found in an old electronics magazine from 1975. Here we are the Sinclair DM2 multimeter 59 pounds plus VAT. It has all the uh, talk here about what it's capable of, three and a half digits, uh, what it can measure and things like that but I'm more interested in the second page and not because it goes into full detail on what it's capable of, but because it's got this cool little storyboard showing what you can do with it. Look at this, it's like a comic. So you can use it in your laboratory. It sits rigidly on its combined carrying handle stand, which it does. It's quite nice that actually it kind of points up towards you so you can read this easily. But it did come with this carrying case as well, which I think is really cool. You can, you can run it off a battery and sling this around your neck and walk around like some kind of mobile technician. There's a picture of the mains adapter which was sold with it, which obviously wouldn't help us with our banana sockets on the back. And the prices are down here, £63.72 including VAT, plus £2.43 for the mains adapter, or about a fiver for the carry case. We better open it up then. So there are four flathead screws to remove going through the rubber feet. We'll get them out and take a look at what's inside. These rubber feet are going to need a clean and we'll do that later on. We'll keep the screws safe on this magnetic bit of the... Oh, they're not magnetic. I wonder if that's on purpose so that they don't interfere with the readings. Anyhow, let's have a look inside. We can take this sort of leathery backplate off and wow, look at that. That's great. I can already see hand-drawn traces. Um, let's have a closer look. We've got this filter capacitor across the power supply input, which is going to be 9 volts DC. And there are these adjustable resistor pots all over the thing, which is obviously for the calibration process. On the right there are our two battery terminals if we wanted to use an internal battery. Looking down here in the bottom left, there's a few more adjustable bits and bobs, and we can see the PCB, which carries all of our inputs, our function select and our range select with its nice hand-drawn traces. There's a couple of fuses on here, a glass fuse here, and a resistor a diode thingy kind of leaning on each other. Not sure what's going on there, some kind of afterthought after the PCBs were made. There's the other fuse. I'm going to quickly test those for continuity to see if they've blown or not at some point in the past. There aren't many logic ICs on here. I can see an AY5 3507 and an LM3900N. The AY chip is the most interesting here. It is an all-in-one three and a half digit voltmeter display chip. Seems to do everything that they need it to do to generate the 
outputs to the four seven segment LED displays based on whatever inputs it's getting, which I think is quite a cool little bespoke bit of kit. Speaking of which, those are our four LED outputs with, I guess, four transistors there, one each and another hand-drawn mini PCB. Doing a quick continuity check on these two fuses and yeah, that one has continuity. And how about this one? Yeah, no problems there. That's good news. I noticed this pin bends out of place. It's not actually doing anything, but I'm just going to bend it back to straighten it up because it's doing my head in a bit. There, that's a bit better. Well, I want to put some power into it and see what happens. And obviously I'm going to use the bench power supply because it has a current limiting feature. I honestly don't know how much current a multimeter should draw, but I'm going to set it to nine volts anyway and set the current limit to something less than an amp. And then we'll take a look at how much it's drawing, see if anything seems to be going wrong or not. We have landed on about 0.7 amps. That'll do, I don't know, maybe it's less, maybe it needs more. Let's see. I don't actually have a couple of handy banana plugs to, to plug this in, but I'm just going to use crocodile clips on the terminals here either side of this capacitor that should have the same effect. So there we are, they're plugged into there and I'm going to see what happens. Let's turn it on. Okay, nothing blew up, no magic smoke and there's something happening on the display as well. Let's push that filter back into place and have a look and yeah, yeah, it's giving us something. That must be a good sign. The value of it seems to be changing. I don't know if that's indicative of a problem or if it just is how it behaves when the probes aren't touching anything. The battery select button seems to work. When I pressed it there, the thing turned off because there's no battery plugged in internally. How about the current draw? Well, I was way off with 0.7. It's actually 10 times less, but we're not getting anywhere near 0.7, which I guess is a good sign. All right, so let's get the board out because we need it out to take a look at putting that screen filter back in. So I'm just using a socket uh, bit there from my socket set. It's plastic nuts and bolts on here, which is great, obviously to stop any kind of interference with the measurements and they come off nice and easily. I'm just gonna have to be careful when I put them back on not to over torque them because I imagine it's very easy to strip those bolts. I'm going to need to remove these wires uh, for the probe inputs just because they're going to stop me from getting the board out of the case. So let's just heat those joints and pull those out. Try not to flick solder all over myself, which I managed to do anyway. Ouch. Okay, just a case of wiggling the board out of the case now and we can take a look on the underside where I'm hoping to see lots of wiggly hand-drawn traces, which is what I like to see on the retro hardware. Okay, here we go. Wow, look at that. That's fantastic, isn't it? We're gonna to have to have a closer look at this. First of all, here it is in all its glory with the 50 mm lens. Now I'll get the macro out and we can have a closer look. Well, hey, fantastic, look at that. Uh, I can see joints which aren't used. I can see some patches. We'll have a closer look at them in a second. Um, I guess this is just the way it was with PCB design 50 years ago, but it just look, it's just so nice to look at, isn't it? Look over here, there's a big patch going on there. And actually further to the right, I can see a joint which has been removed and a wire has been poked all the way through and soldered to a trace. I'm guessing that's not a standard factory mod, it must have been a bodge that happened during manufacture. There's also a couple more patches down here in the bottom right. I don't know if these got resolved in future editions or even how many editions of this board there were. If you've got one, have a look and let me know what yours says on it. While we're talking about PCBs, I want to build a ZX Mermulator. I'm going to be doing it in an upcoming video and I'm going directly to PCBWay, who is sponsoring the video today, to get the PCBs made. Now I'm absolutely terrified of all this, it's all very new to me, but PCBWay made the whole process very easy, super simple, most of the settings were preset to what seemed to be appropriate. All I had to do was pick the shipping, drag and drop the Gerber files and wait for a review and we were ready to go. I'm really grateful to PCBWay for sponsoring me. Go and check them out and see what they can do for you. While I had the board out of the case, I noticed how dirty all of these button caps were. So we're gonna be cleaning them up in a second. First of all, I want to put this plastic filter back on over these LED displays. Just doing a quick check now to make sure it doesn't have to be on a particular way around. 
and it seems to work both ways and now that I'm holding the part I can see that there's only one way that this could fit so we'll go with that. It's a bit mucky so I'm going to give it a quick wipe with some alcoholic spirit and see if we can get it in better shape. I think that's looking a bit better, there's lots of small scratches on there, not much I can do about that. I'm using double sided 3M tip, just putting one piece on either side of the cutout for the screen and I'm going to push it in there and hope that has enough sticking power for it to stay in place without becoming irretrievably stuck forever. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. It seems to have slotted into place and the tape is doing a pretty good job of holding it in place. Now, I want to get these button caps off and I found that they just pull off. Some were a little bit more stubborn than others, but I managed to get all of them off and I'm going to be going over them with some alcoholic spirit and giving them a bit of a bath in some warm soapy water. So here they are, all looking a little bit grubby, but nothing that we can't handle. As you can see, this one in particular is pretty bad, but all I needed was a little bit of alcoholic spirit and a cloth, and I got it pretty well restored. I have noticed that the yellowing is fairly obvious. You can see where they've been poking out of the case. They have yellowed a bit with sunlight, and I'm not into retro brighting. I don't know how to do that, and it's not going to bother me too much, so I'm going to leave it as it is. As for these rubber feet, they also need a clean, so I'm going to put everything into a bath of warm soapy water for a few hours, and this is how they came out. Not too bad. A little bit of a rub down with a cotton bud, and they were pretty much fine. I do need to refit the negative battery terminal because it fell off while I was messing around with the board. So I'm going to strip this wire back, tin the end, and just solder it back on from where it came. Nice and easy. I don't actually have a battery, a 9 volt battery, which is big enough and fits in here. I do have one big one, but it's a bit too wide. So I'm not planning on using this with a battery. I'm just going to be using it with an external power supply. So I'm going to leave these battery terminals loose. In fact, I should probably bag them up at some point so they don't risk shorting anything out. And now I just need to put the plastic nuts back on the plastic bolts and solder the two yellow wires back on to the probe input sockets. So let's get that done now. As I mentioned, I'm being careful not to over tighten this because I imagine I would very quickly muller these plastic bolts. Lovely. Now what about these two wires? Let's get them soldered on. There are little eyes in these sockets that I can poke it through. So it's very easy to keep it in place while I do the soldering. We're all set to power up again now and start making some measurements and hopefully doing a bit of a rough calibration on the thing. So with our power applied, we can turn it on and I have a bit of a problem. The only probes I have are from the fluke meter and they look like little hair dryers now that I'm looking at them closely. But point is they won't fit in here. This is just gonna work with some kind of banana plug. So what can I do initially? Just quick and easy, I'm gonna use this power supply lead that I made up to do a first bit of calibration. I've got it set to a resistance measurement and I've shorted out the inputs. I'm going to use this set zero adjustment here to get it to read zero, which is one of the calibration steps described in the DM2 manual. And that seems to have worked, which is cool. Now, by disassembling those two banana plugs, I found a little solution. They actually fit really nicely onto the end of these probes and then I can put them directly into the front of the DM2 and that works great. I mean it's it's a little bit janky but it's gonna it's gonna work for us now while we're making this video. So there they are in there and now we can start taking some measurements. I can't really do the calibration process as described in the manual. I don't have the equipment but what I can do is just take a reference measurement. So for example here I'm measuring resistance across a voltage supply to one of these chips in the, in the Speccy, 2.77 kilo ohms on the Fluke, and I'm getting 2.79, 2.78 on the DM2. So I can make a little bit of a tweak using one of the adjustable pots on the circuit board and get this down to 2.77. And then I, I'm happy anyway that the resistance measurement is close enough for my needs anyway. 
So there's a little adjustment. I should be using a plastic screwdriver, but I'm not. 2.78, a little bit more. See if we can get it to read. Bang on 2.77. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. Hang on. Let's try going the other direction. 2.75. Third time's the charm. Fourth time's the charm. 2.7. Fifth time's the charm. 2.77. Okay, that's resistance calibrated as far as I'm concerned. What about AC voltage? Am I really going to stick this in the mains? Go on, let's have a go see what happens. So I'm getting 221. I should be getting 230 on the UK main supply. So let's make a couple of tweaks and see if we can get it to be bang on 230. I'm using the instruction manual here for the DM2, which I found online. So I know which pots to tweak to do each of the calibration steps. So what have I got here? 243, I've gone way too far. And long story short, I got it to read 230 volts AC, which is bang on. Next one. Next, we need to calibrate DC voltage. Before I do that, I'm going to put these button caps back on because they've dried after their warm soapy bath and it's going to look a lot nicer. Here we go. Let's get these on. They just push on and I think it looks lovely. They look nice and clean compared to how they were. They're not perfectly lined up. Um, I don't know if they were perfectly lined up. Maybe I'm just looking at them closely now. But anyway, it's all on there now and we have a nice clean looking faceplate. Lovely. So moving on with the DC voltage calibration. Again, I can't follow the instructions exactly because I can't generate the voltages required with the precision required, but I'm just gonna compare it to the fluke meter on this ZX Spectrum. So these chips receive minus five, plus 12 and plus five volts. I'm gonna measure all three with the power applied with the fluke meter and I'm getting minus 5.07, plus 12.56 and plus 5.08. Now it's just a case of repeating those measurements with the DM2 and then making some adjustments to get them to match up as closely as possible. So on the minus five supply, we were getting minus 5.05, which is pretty close for a 50 year old multimeter that's just come out of storage. 12.64 uh, on the plus 12 and 5.12 on the plus five. Let's start making some adjustments and see how close we can get it on all three of these voltages. Speeding this up because I was fiddling around with it for ages, trying to get them all to be pretty close. And here are the results. We had minus 5.07 exactly on, on the minus five, which is perfect. Plus 12.57, which is 0 0.01 volts off on the plus 12 and plus 5.07, which again is 0 0.01 volts off on the plus five. And that's good enough for me for my needs. And I think I'm going to use it for future videos. Maybe for the repair jobs, I'm going to use the fluke still, but this is going to look cool alongside the speckies on the YouTube channel at least. One last little thing that's annoying me is this sticker mark. I'm not sure what the sticker was, but it's left a big horrible crusty mess behind. So let's clean that up. Didn't overdo it with the alcoholic spirit because I didn't want to take the paint off, but I think it looks a lot better now. And here is the finished thing, up and running, roughly calibrated and cleaned up. And it now has pride of place on the desk right next to the power supply and the weller. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.